All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the first annual Brookhaven National Laboratory Research Slam competition. So my name is Sharon Pepinella, and I am the Senior Research Programs Representative for the Office of Educational Programs and the MC for today's competition. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Joanne Hewitt, our new laboratory director, who will deliver a brief welcome address. Now, Joanne, I'm not sure how long we say new for, but I'm told it's about 10 years. <laughs> so as most of you are aware, Joanne came to us from the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory, but what you might not know is that she ran the SLAM competition while at SLAC. So in the words of Michael Corleone, just when she thought she was out, we pulled her back in. Uh, but in all seriousness, Joanne has provided valuable insight and recommendations to help us design and implement this inaugural event at BNL. So there is no better way to mark this occasion than for her to kick us off. So please join me in welcoming Joanne Hewitt. Thank you, Sharon. And I would just like to take a moment out here at the start to thank Sharon for all that she has done to organize this inaugural event. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> so welcome, everybody, and thank you very much for coming. Slams are really a lot of fun. <laughs> um, I get a lot of enjoyment about, from them. <laughs> all right, I'll stand in the middle. That'll work. No. Maybe I'll just use this mic. So is this one on? Yeah, okay. I'll just use him. Um, what's very important in science is to be able to communicate your results to all different types of audiences. And this is a very special skill that doesn't always come naturally to scientists in particular. You literally never know. We used to call it the elevator speech because you literally never know when you're going to be in an elevator with somebody of influence and you ha literally have 60 seconds to tell them why your work, your area, your field, Brookhaven, should be funded. And I can say it really does happen because a year ago I found that I had two minutes with Nancy Pelosi and I had to tell her that cosmology was really important for her to think about and she should fund it. Not only is this an important skill for you all to learn, and I thank you so much for participating today, um, but it's just a lot of fun. These slams started, oh, I don't know, when did we first start seeing slams? I think about 15 years ago was the first time I started seeing a slam, and they've been, um, very good ways uh, and entertaining ways to communicate to the general public. And it's just really started in the DOE system. I think LBL, Berkeley Lab, might have been the first one uh, to hold a slam uh, with early career researchers uh, at their institution. And they are really intense about it, I have to say. <laughs> they spend money to hire external coaches and they take a whole year to plan the event. and. This is our very first one. We're having one because this has grown in such popularity that it's grown from Berkeley to a Bay Area research slam that had all four laboratories in the Bay Area. That started three years ago, so that's when Slack started having a slam. And now it's grown to all 17 national labs across the complex in the country. Uh, and it will culminate in a competition, a slam competition in DC next month with the Secretary of Energy. So this is really exciting. This is a great way to introduce your science to your laboratory. And I thank everyone for coming in the audience because you have a participation role as well. At the end, we have a series of august panel members who will judge the contestant's performance on many different criteria, science of course being first. But there's also a people's choice vote at the end. So that gives the audience a chance to participate and have their choice uh, also be awarded. And the awardees do receive some money, 
which is always nice. And uh, thank you uh, for doing all the work that you've done. We look forward to the event. Let's kick it off. Let's get started. Thank you, Joanne. Before we jump into the talks, I want to extend my sincerest thanks to both Joanne Hewitt and John Hill for supporting this event, along with David Manning, who also provided the funds for today's SLAM prizes for the winners. David is unfortunately unable to join us today because he's doing something incredibly boring like hiking through Croatia, uh, but he sends his regards. I also want to thank Joe Gettler, who has worked closely with me to help develop this SLAM competition, along with Scott Bronson and Rebecca Cummings, who provided valuable insights for our participants during the practice sessions. Of course, a big thank you to our panel of judges for recognizing the importance of this type of event and taking the time out of their incredibly busy schedules to participate. And I'll speak more about our panel of judges in just a moment. We appreciate the scientists, supervisors, and mentors who have supported our participants' research and helped them to develop their talks. And further, I'd like to extend our thanks to Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory for bringing the 17 labs together on a national stage with the SLAM competition, highlighting the importance of the work being done at the labs before congressional representatives. Of course, a big thank you to Ken White and the Office of Educational Programs. And lastly, a thank you to our participants who have worked extensively to generate practice and refine their talks, and without whom we wouldn't have today's event. Before we jump into the SLAM talks, I just want to tell you a little bit about how this competition is going to go. So each participant has three minutes to provide us with their research, and the, this talk should be geared towards a general audience. They cannot use any sort of costume, they can't use music, they can't have animations. This is really the reason David's not here is because they told him he couldn't break dance. Uh, so they, it's just as, as Joanne mentioned, it's really an elevator talk. Throughout the competition, we will have a trivia question following each of the talks. This will provide our judges some time to take notes about the talk they just heard. And this will allow you to answer questions for prizes. We have lovely B&L swag. Uh, the way this trivia will work is I will read the question. There will be four multiple choice responses. You cannot raise your hand until I read the last option, and then you can raise your hand. Aleda has the microphone. She will run around to whoever she sees first to answer the question. I did not put a microphone in the middle of the aisle because in the interest of B&L safety, I figured people jumping over each other or knocking each other down to get to the microphone was probably not the best thing. So Aleda will be our runner. Uh, after the competition, we, will, we do invite you to a reception that will be right outside in the lobby. During this time, the judges will deliberate to decide the winners of the competition. At that time, the People's Choice selection will also open. If you look at the agenda that you were provided when you came into the auditorium, you will see a QR code on that agenda. As soon as this competition ends, that judging will open and you can select your People's Choice. That will close at 2.50 p.m., right before we come back in here for the award ceremony at 3 o'clock p.m. After each talk, there will be no questions, please, but you are welcome to interact with the participants during the reception. I, of course, would like to acknowledge our 2023 B&L Slam judges. As you can see, we have a very esteemed panel of judges, including Joanne Hewitt, our laboratory director, John Hill, our Deputy Director for Science and Technology. Mary Rogers, our Small biz Business Liaison Administrator. Lisa Miller, our Manager of US CEO, NSLS2. And Karen McNulty-Walsh, the Principal Media and Communications Specialist. You can see we have a panel that has a diverse background in science, policy, communication, because we wanted a panel who could uh, address all of the topics across the board as well as the judging criteria that we are using for these SLAM talks, which will be the same judging criteria for the participants who go to the national competition. So as Joanne mentioned, we have a first, second, third, and People's Choice Award, as well as one winner who will go advance to the national competition in November. 
So the criteria is based on scientific content, the presenter's ability to be engaging, to capture your interest and your enthusiasm, and each presenter will also have one slide to support their talk. So let's get started. Our first speaker is Justin Goodrich from the NSLS2 Photon Science Division. Justin is a direct descendant of the second US president, John Adams, and in his free time, rescues feral cats and volunteers at a local animal shelter. With Halloween around the corner, he speaks to us today about the tale of the ghost cat. Please welcome Dr. Goodrich. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon. I'd like for you to imagine that you're in a dim room, and suddenly, from a single image of a cat, a second shadowy phantom feline mysteriously emerges beside it. This isn't a tale from the latest supernatural thriller, but the forefront of our quantum enhanced microscope project ongoing down the road at NSLS2. An intriguing showcase of our technique is depicted here, where a, a metal cutout of a single cat, shown here on the left, results in both a direct image and a so-called ghost image of the cat on the detector, shown on the right. Since their discovery, x-rays have unveiled the invisible structure of all sorts of materials. But like any powerful tool, they come with their challenges. Extended exposure to x-rays can alter and possibly even destroy de uh, delicate biomaterials. In medical contexts, the stakes are higher, potential harm to our DNA. These aren't just challenges, they're significant impediments in bioimaging and medicine. But what if there was a way to reduce the x-ray dosage to theoretical limits while maintaining high quality imaging? Enter the realm of what is called quantum ghost imaging. Although ubiquitous using visible light, this technique is very difficult to achieve with x-rays. Using the unmatched brilliance of NSLS2, combined with state-of-the-art detector technology, we're venturing into this formative world. Um, proper lighting is the key to any type of imaging. Here we use something called entanglement to generate a very special light source. Uh, entanglement is a concept at the heart of quantum mechanics. Um, where two or more particles have their properties linked in a way that is impossible to describe with the classical laws that govern everyday life. It's as if you roll two magically linked dice and by observing only one, you could instantly know the state of the other, even if it was completely out of view. As crazy as it sounds, using entanglement, we're able to image an object using portions of the light field that never interacted with it, providing a pathway to reducing the dose to theoretical limits. Our team has achieved record rates of generating these entangled x-rays, and we've performed unprecedented measurements of their properties. Our work is a beacon of hope for every researcher wary of sample damage and every, um, every patient concerned about x-ray exposure. Um, the implications are profound. We can use our technique to uh, reduce the x-ray dosage and to provide superior resolution. Remember, sometimes the most enchanting tales of ghosts and shadows are not in our books, but unfolding in our labs. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. It's trivia time. Ready, Elena? All right. First question. And again, you can only raise your hand once I get to option D. What is BNL's motto? Is it A, the world is ours? B, a passion for discovery? C, the energy of innovation? Or D, discovery all day, every day? A passion for discovery. Passion for discovery is correct. So your options again are a ceramic B&L mug, a B&L water bottle, or a B&L ball cap. Our next speaker is Jack Griffiths from Condensed Matter Physics and Material Science. 
Jack is an avid Star Wars fan and is currently trying to brew English ales for a taste of home. Today, he tells us about local structure, global impact, targeting next generation materials. Please welcome Dr. Griffiths. Imagine that you're visiting the US for the first time in January and you ask a friend what weather to expect. They say 30 degrees Fahrenheit on average. That's true, but it hides the blistering cold of Minneapolis and the temperate warmth of Dallas. My point, local variation is important and averages can hide the true answers to your questions. The same is true for the structure of materials. All the properties of the miracle materials in the chips and your electronic devices including how they respond to electricity, fundamentally comes down to the arrangement of their atoms. We can find that arrangement by firing x-rays at the material and watching how they scatter away. These materials typically consist of a box of atoms, like this made up box on the left, that repeats in all directions. By looking at the scattering, you can find this box. Brilliant, job done. No, as most materials, a lot of materials, have what we call local structure. In our example, the green atom likes to sit closer to one of the blue atoms than the others. Every green atom in the material randomly picks which blue neighbor to get closer to. So while the structure on the left is correct on average, it's these local distortions, these deviations from the average that are actually incredibly important to know. In our method, we pass high quality x-ray data through a mathematical machine to extract a list of all of the distances between every pair of atoms in the material, and we can directly read off this shorter blue-green distance. This is the mature and powerful PDF method. Now, any new material for electronics that might make computers, say, faster, cheaper, more efficient to meet the rising needs of AI would need to be able to switch between two structures. Can we use PDF to better understand this structural switching? Until recently, a material like that could switch a thousand billion times in the second it takes for a measurement. We're too slow. But now, there are a few new state-of-the-art x-ray facilities, including in the US, that can measure at these incredible speeds. It's not as simple as just taking our experiments to the new facilities and running them the same way, as the cost of speed is reduced data quality and complicated analysis. At Brookhaven, I have identified and tackled the challenges in this new technique, this experimental variant, to prove that these measurements are possible at current facilities. And they are. We were able to see atoms in a material disorder from a strong laser pulse before pulling and pushing each other into a new ordered structure. We're very much in the early days of this whole ultra-fast local structure endeavor, but it holds great potential for our understanding of structural switching. As for the next time you want to know the weather, I'd suggest you just Google it. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Champion. BNL is home to how many Nobel Prizes? A, three, B, five, C, Seven or D, nine? Seven. Seven is correct. Our next speaker is Jasmine Hatcher-Lamar from the Collider Accelerator Department. Jasmine actually started out as a nursing student in college, but after witnessing a student almost faint during her first week in a pre-nursing course, the irrational fear of fainting being contagious led her to explore other career options, and we're glad she found her way to BNL. Jasmine is presenting Medical Isotope Production, the Fight Against Cancer with Radiochemistry. Please welcome Dr. Hatcher-Lamar. The difference between a poison and a remedy is the dose. 
This is especially true of radioactivity. We know from the past radioactivity can cause immense destruction and end lives. But in small doses, radioactivity produced from radioactive isotopes can improve and even prolong life. Radioactivity is generated from isotopes, which are unstable versions of elements that release energy or particles when they decay. At Brookhaven National Laboratory, we produce isotopes by blasting targets with high energy particle beams to irradiate them. Those isotopes are then used to treat and image disease. I don't need to tell you that cancer kills. Using one type of radioactive decay, we can track the progress of treatment of cancer. Using another, we can kill cancer cells. A powerful example of this is actinium-225, which I was introduced to as a graduate student at Brookhaven. Actinium-225 is a radioactive element which is very effective at treating cancer. That's what you see in this picture behind me. Here, this man has active tumors. And on the other side here, he doesn't. We need to produce more actinium for research and clinical trials to win this battle against cancer and continue this work. I am part of a group here at Brookhaven dedicated to producing actinium-225 and other isotopes. Specifically, I am a chemist in the medical isotope group. My job is to figure out new ways to prepare and separate radioactive elements. When we irradiate source materials we produce, to produce actinium, about 400 additional isotopes are made. Separating one isotope from 400 is not easy, but that's one of the things we chemists do. We find out ways to exploit chemical differences to separate isotopes we need from the isotopes we don't. As a graduate student, I studied extractants to help us separate actinium based on its chemical properties. A few years later, as a staff scientist, I'm excited about exploring methods to produce other important medical isotopes. I'm equally excited about my research to streamline our chemistry. Two ways we can do that are with automation and machine learning. A programmed automated system can cut the time we need to produce isotopes by at least half. This reduces human error and effort. And with machine learning and artificial intelligence, we can speed up the discovery of new separation strategies. Currently, all the separations work is carried out using traditional chemistry techniques. And much like an old-fashioned Sunday dinner, this can take some time. Machine learning and automation are like those all-in-one instant pots. They can do some things very fast and well, but other things still have to be prepared the old school way. By applying those with traditional chemistry, we'll cook up new ways to get actinium and other isotopes from the idea stage to the research and clinical stage at much faster rates and save the people we care about. Thank you, Jasmine. Trivia time. Irving Berlin wrote this 1918 musical review while stationed at Camp Upton. Is it A, Yip Yip Yap Hank? B, as thousands cheer? C, Mr. President? Or D, New York State of Mind? I hope you wore your Fitbit today. Yip, yip, yap, hank. Yip, yip, yap, hank is correct. I know I heard some of you giggling. You didn't think that was the right answer. Our next speaker is Amanda Horn from the Office of Educational Programs. Amanda owns two horses, Prada and Bailey, and loves traveling the world and trying different foods. She is especially fond of regional cheeses. Amanda is speaking today about bringing diversity into STEM. Please welcome Dr. Horn. I know you've heard the term before, diversity, equity, and inclusion. DEI. But what does it mean to bring DEI together with STEM? Why is it important to STEM? Research has shown that companies with a diverse workforce are more productive, engaged, and innovative. National labs are tackling critical scientific challenges, and we need a diverse workforce in order to deliver scientific discoveries and technical breakthroughs. The research journal Cell has boldly stated that science has a racism problem, which includes gatekeeping, structural racism, and underrepresentation. 
This goes beyond the professional realm, down the STEM pipeline and into the pre-college realm. For students who are underrepresented in STEM, they face many gaps and leaks in this pipeline. And for some, these leaks can start as early as kindergarten. In order to meet this need, students need more than just their formal education they typically receive. One approach to this challenge is considering the importance of experiential knowledge, giving students access and opportunity to authentic STEM experiences. Now, one way to do this is through some of our programming. An informal multi-week summer program hosted by BNL for underrepresented 10th grade students that are interested in STEM. This program can introduce them to science here at the laboratory and present them with opportunities for high school, college, and beyond. To capture the influence of this program on the students, I utilized a series of interviews with the students and their parents. After a qualitative analysis, it was clear that there was strong evidence that the program had a positive influence on students' perception of STEM and STEM careers, especially for students who came into the program without a clear STEM goal or interest. Now, this wasn't a huge surprise. Other research has shown similar results. But what was interesting was that the program curriculum and guest speakers were the two factors with the strongest positive influence. Including the parents in those interviews gave an entirely new perspective to this research. And it was interesting that the findings also concluded that the program had a positive influence on those parents as well, even though they weren't active participants. Administrators should consider how their programs may impact other family members, including parents or possibly siblings. Now, trying to consider what this means for us, we have to consider how we are designing our programs. Some aspects of the program may have stronger influence than others, and we should capitalize and be really thoughtful on how we're designing those programs. Additionally, parents play a critical role in the choices students are making regarding their education and careers. If we can influence both parents and students through these programs, this gives us another path to support students who are underrepresented in STEM. Now, knowing that these programs can positively influence both students' and parents' perceptions of STEM and STEM careers really acknowledges how important it is to the national labs. It's also critical to those supporting the STEM pipeline, including STEM professionals, educators, mentors, and administrators. If our goal is to fully integrate and bring DE&I and STEM together, we must consider all aspects of the STEM pipeline and provide opportunities, access, and support to those who have been historically marginalized. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Ready? The, excuse me, the phenomenon in which a material conducts electricity without energy loss is known as A, semiconductivity, B, superconductivity, C, ferromagnetism, or D, hysteresis. Superconductivity. Superconductivity is correct. <laughs> What's been the most popular swag so far? Uh, cups, cups. Oh, okay. All right. I thought the hats were going to go. Hello. <laughs> this is too high. <laughs> Our next speaker is Zhang Jing Jiang from Environmental and Climate Sciences. Zhang Jing is an experienced flute player and has an affinity for M-related subjects, including math, models, meteorology, music, and her mom. <laughs> she shares her research today about healing the earth. Please welcome Dr. Jiang. What do we do when people get sick? We go to the doctor. But what about the Earth? With the increased burning of fossil fuels in the recent two centuries, a huge amount of human-caused emissions are pouring into the atmosphere. The Earth is having a severe fever. The temperature is rising at abnormal rate, and extreme weather events are happening all around the world. We saw heat waves in Europe, floods in Pakistan, and wildfires in Canada and Australia. These events are not only climate warnings, 
but also the Earth crying for help. So we climate scientists who work as Earth surgeons come onto the stage. We have different kinds of observations, including site measurements, aircrafts, and satellites to give the Earth a physical checkup. But what about processes that cannot be measured? Can we reproduce the past or can we predict the future? With respect to these problems, our community put a great effort into building the Earth system model, which is a digital twin of the Earth. These models are of great importance in explaining extreme weather events and climate change, but large uncertainty lies in every corner of the model, just like you never know which hole the mole comes out on a vacuum mole machine. <laughs> to reduce the large uncertainty, here at BNL, I work closely with scientists doing field campaigns, earth system modeling, and computational science to construct the model observing co-design system to improve climate prediction. On one hand, by incorporating model in, uh, observation into the model, we try to prevent model from getting out of control. In some cases, the model error can increase like a kite string with one boom it flies away and never comes back. By constraining the model error within a small range, we try to make the model more and more similar to reality. This helps us reproduce the history and predict the future more accurately. On the other hand, by diagnosing and dissecting this digital sibling of the Earth, we try to make the best use of the model to guide measurement deployment, to tell the observers well to measure what to measure and how to measure. Acting like a doctor by putting the stethoscope in the right place while safeguarding the health of our planet. The reduction of uncertainty keeps us safe in the changing climate, and the increase in return on investment helps us safe in the expensive world. That's the value of information. Thank you. Thank you, Zhang Zheng. Next question. Who was the first director of Brookhaven National Laboratory? Was it A, Ken White? <laughs> B, George Vineyard? C, Michael Miller? Or D, Philip Morse? I see one hand. <laughs> Morse. <laughs> Philip Morse is correct. You'll have to brush up on your B&L history. speaker is Juan Jimenez from the chemistry department. Juan is an avid cook and an apparent dog lover as he once ran down a crowded road stopping traffic to rescue someone's dog that had jumped from a moving vehicle. Today Juan is speaking about the age of carbon. Please welcome Dr. Jimenez. It's in the food we eat, the very air we breathe, and the fabric of our being. Carbon permeates all aspects of life on Earth. But by all expert accounts, by 2050, this self-same carbon in the atmosphere, in the form of greenhouse gas, threatens to be the single greatest threat to humanity of our generation. My task as a scientist and chemist at Brookhaven National Labs is to take this otherwise insurmountable obstacle and transform it into a boon for humanity. Specifically, I'm doing this by creating catalysts, which are materials that allow an otherwise impossible chemical reaction to move forward. Think mixing water and sugar doesn't magically make whiskey, but if you throw some catalysts into the mix, suddenly it's happy hour. <laughs> so if you combine this with, with the, the work I'm approaching to it is looking at this through two distinct means. 
On the one hand, I'm taking carbon dioxide, which is the most abundant greenhouse gas driving climate change, and transforming it into usable chemicals, specifically into natural gas for home heating or as an intermediate to jet fuel to enable sustainable aviation. To do this, I developed catalysts that allow your carbon dioxide to be tunably switched into whichever product you want, allowing you to have broadband distribution of your specific products which is particularly important because you need scalable, robust, and diverse solution to a diverse problem. On the other hand, using my patented technology developed in-house at Brookhaven National Lab, I'm taking natural gas and converting it into liquid fuels. The reason why you want to convert natural gas into liquid fuel is because most natural gas are emitted in highly isolated rural wells that aren't really accessible to most big chemical plants. So you need a modular, robust system that allows you to tap into these wells and convert this excess methane, which is an incredibly potent greenhouse gas, and transform it into a liquid, potable fuel. So what's my central tenet that really binds these two distinct approaches of carbon dioxide and methane is the philosophy that, uh, that we have a global problem, which is climate change. And for this, you need to assemble a global team. So on this end, I've assembled a group of scientists that ranges from the US to South America to Europe and Asia to really give me the leverage of understanding this global problem and tackle this problem specifically for greenhouse gases. And combining this global leverage and the state-of-the-art technology afforded to me by Brookhaven National Lab, specifically the National Synchrotron Light Source, I'm able to walk through these chemical transformations atom by atom to give us breakthrough insights and unprecedented knowledge into these chemical transformations. So armed with this knowledge and this technology to develop these materials and allow these scalable chemical reactions, we can then take 2050 not as a doomsday, but as a new age for carbon, fueling our passion for discovery. Thank you. Thank you, Juan. Are you all nervous now? Our next question. What is the largest Office of Educational Programs, OEP, community event? Is it A, Science Bowl, B, Maglev, C, Science Fair, or D, the Bridge Building Competition? If you're in OEP, you can't answer this one. A, the science bowl is incorrect. C, science fair is correct. Our next speaker is Dasmeet Kar from the biology department. Dasmeet has a love for both art and biotechnology, leading her to become a plant biologist by profession while keeping art close to her heart. She and her 10-year-old daughter enjoy drawing and painting together, with both realizing a fondness for drawing female fashion models. Dasmeet's talk today focuses on the first line of defense. Please welcome Dr. Kar. Animals can run away from predators. Humans can pop open a bottle of Tylenol and combat the sickness. Plants can't do either of these two things. Can they fight to survive? They have to. So plants who supply about 80% of the world's feed, they have to go under constant attack by intruders like microscopic bacteria, and fungi and ever-changing climatic conditions like UV exposure, heat, salinity, cold stress, and so on. Indeed, these plants have threat, more threat under the global climatic conditions from these stressors. 50% of the crop yield is lost 
throughout the world because of the stressors. So to combat the stress, we have to have a conditional training of these plants, conditioning these plants for, of this, from their, for their responses to the stimuli of the stressors is what we need in the present scenario. So knowing about the interactions of the pathogens and the plants can help these plants and help us for biopreparedness. The first line of defense for the plants is residing at the cell wall or the cell surface in the form of web of compounds such as lignin. Lignin not only provides a good support to the plant, but also is having to keep the, keep the plant safe by keeping the pathogens out of it. So more, more, of that, more to add to it is that researchers have found that the lignin, it intensifies or it increases under the stressful conditions. So, my goal here is to understand how exactly this mechanism works. Here at BNL, what I am doing is I am looking at the underlying me mechanisms and the unknown proteins that are helping to do the signaling cascade for lignin deposition under the stressful conditions. To do this or to achieve this goal, I uh, have two strategies. First, I predict those candidate novel genes, which could be underlying this lignin deposition under stressful conditions, then generate a mutant using a Nobel Prize winning technology, CRISPR, that is a gene editing technology, and then I induce several artificial stresses like UV light or cold stress. Just imagine, isn't it interesting if we could have plants which can combat the stresses better under extreme climatic transitions, right? So overall, the goal of my research is to revolutionize our current understanding of the biological events underlying such mechanisms and transform our ability to prepare for and to respond to both biological and environmental threats, hence preparing us for bioeconomy. Thank you. Thank you, Dasmi. Here we go. The Long Island Solar Farm, located at BNL, can provide electricity for roughly A, 1,300 households, B, 2,900 households, C, 3,100 households, or D, 4,500 households. A 1300 household. 1300 is incorrect. Uh, is it C? Did you say C? Yeah. 3100 households? That is incorrect. <laughs> One more incorrect answer, I get to keep the swag. B, 2900. 2,900, also incorrect. <laughs> Alita, I want a hat. The correct answer, in fact, is 4,500 households. This is why I made it multiple choice. Our next speaker is Daniel Marks from the Electron-Ion Collider. Daniel shares a birthday with Charles Darwin, Abraham Lincoln, and his aunt, all very important people, <laughs> and enjoys learning languages. In fact, he is currently working on his learning his sixth language. Today, Daniel will be telling us about the EIC, an exciting, innovative collider. Please welcome Dr. Marks. Have you ever stood on a scale and wondered where all those pounds came from? You're certainly not alone. Virtually all the mass in our bodies and objects around us is due to the protons and neutrons that form an atom's nucleus. Inside these protons and neutrons, 
are quarks and gluons. But curiously, if you add up the masses of these fundamental particles, you only get about a percent of the total mass. The rest must somehow come from the interactions between them in the nucleus. But how exactly does this happen? This is just one of the questions about the atomic nucleus, the electron ion collider, the EIC, will help answer. I'm part of the team designing this new machine, which will be built right here at BNL in a 2.4 mile circular tunnel. By colliding electrons with protons, or ions, which are just charged atoms, we'll be able to scan the structure of the nucleus and produce 3D images of the quarks and gluons inside. The IC will be a highly complex and unique machine. For a start, electrons and ions have vastly different masses, and they need to be accelerated in separate beamlines. In fact, we've got to build two rings just for the electrons, a booster to accelerate them, and another ring for colliding them. Each ring will contain many hundreds of magnets. Some of them bend the beam around the ring, others focus it, and many more correct for errors and unwanted effects. My work involves arranging all these magnets around the ring and setting their strengths so that we can control the beam position and size to less than the width of a human hair. It's particularly challenging because the EIC will collide beams with a wide range of energies, and our design needs to be flexible enough to support this. And somehow, we've got to do all this while squeezing four rings into a tunnel about the width of an airplane cabin. We've been working hard on this challenge for many years, and I'm excited that we now have a promising design that meets our requirements, and we're well on the path to start building the EIC in just a couple years' time. In a decade from now, we'll be sitting in the control room, watching the first collisions. They will allow us to unlock the secrets of the atomic nucleus. So that one day, when we stand on a scale, we won't just blame the nucleus for the number we see, we'll actually understand it. Thank you, Daniel. Everybody warmed up with the trivia questions? We're good this time? The relativistic heavy ion collider, Rick, was the first machine to recreate A, ionizing radiation, B, quark gluon plasma, C, the Higgs boson, or D, antimatter. Quark gluon plasma. Quark gluon plasma is correct. Our next speaker is Rena Sharma from the biology department. Rena is known as the magic girl because trust her, she can do magic. She fully intends to rule with a tap and a twirl to thunderous applause. Rena's magic translates to her research, where today she focuses on microbe magic. Say no to chemicals. Please welcome Dr. Sharma. Good afternoon, all. So today, I'm here to share a story about the micro magic, where in reducing the heavy metals and synthetic fertilizers, how they are useful. So once upon a time, there existed a joyful soil. She was nourishing the mankind and every living being with bountiful harvest. But then the food demand increased. And we people, we started using the synthetic fertilizers. And overuse of that causes the detrimental effects on the soil. Well, not only that, due to human intervention, heavy metals get introduced to the soil, affecting 70 to 80% of the soil and the water resources. And what is happening at the later stages? 
we humans are getting affected. But what is the alternative? Where we can produce enough food, but not at the cost of hurting nature? The solution lies in the nature itself, the unsung heroes of the soil, the magical microbes. So being a part of the pioneering group at Brookhaven National Lab, I embark on this mission to tackle this issue. For this, we isolated the microbes from the contaminated sites. And those microbes are already resilient to those contaminants. And when we introduce those microbes as the affected soil for the plant cultivation, what we got, the astonishing results. We found that those plants treated with the microbes, they have the superior growth and development. Not only that, they can also retain the essential micronutrients in their tissues, which we observed by using the amazing facility of X-ray fluorescence imaging at NSLS2. When we moved to the genetic level, we found a specific group of the genes associated with these microbes and the plants which have already known to help the plants to deal with the heavy metal contamination. So by taking our research at the larger scale and using these microbes as biofertilizers, not only going to help the plants to retain essential nutrients, but can also help for the soil remediation. And I take pride that being a part of the Brookhaven National Lab working on this topic, that I'm also a part of helping the nature. And this is a, actually an emerging field where people are actually using the genetically modified microbes. But in our case, we are using the microbes which are found in the nature. By doing so, we can rekindle the joy of the soil and she can continue to tell her amazing story of resilience and abundance. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Rena. Next up, this debuted at BNL's Visitor's Day in 1958 and is arguably considered to be the first video game. Is it A, Periscope, B, Tennis for Two, C, Speedway, or D, Pong? Tennis for two? Tennis for two is correct. And just a quick reminder, you're only going to get credit if you raise your hand after D is said. Our next speaker is Tamana Suba from the Environmental and Climate Sciences. Tamana belongs to a tribe from the Eastern Himalayas with its own distinct language, script, and culture. Another artist amongst our myths, when she's not donning her science cape, she unleashes her inner Picasso through caricaturing and acrylic painting. Today, Tamana will tell us about the climate twist, sea breeze and aerosol adventures. Please welcome Dr. Suba. New York. Houston, London, Mumbai. Besides being populated and polluted cities, they're all coastal, experiencing the phenomenon called sea breeze that impacts climate. This wind blows from the water body towards the land caused by the differential heating between the land and the water. Next, meets tiny troublemakers, the aerosols, Approximately 400 of these particles can span along the diameter of a single human hair. But watch out, they can really mess with the climate, big time. Now the question is, does sea breeze interact with aerosols? And if yes, does that impact climate? In 2022, I participated in a Brookhaven National Lab-led a year-long field campaign called Tracer at Houston, a coastal city in the southern Texas United States. We employed Department of Energy's mobile facility to measure aerosols and clouds. More than 100 scientists from all across the globe joined us, and voila, the weather games began. I also employed weather research and forecasting model 
to eavesdrop on this adventure of aerosols and sea breeze. Now, using this integration of model and measurement, what I found was that sea breeze can be quite bossy, telling aerosols where to be in the atmosphere. They can disperse the aerosols horizontally and vertically at different layers of the atmosphere and also impact air's water content. Now, the aerosols are not less adventurous. They're always interacting with the incoming sunlight directly and indirectly. So, in this cascade of adventure between the sea breeze and aerosols, there is someone who's getting really angry, and that's the temperature. Messing up with the incoming sunlight can change the atmospheric warming, which changes the Earth's temperature. So, to answer our big question, yes, sea breeze interacts with aerosols, messing up with the incoming sunlight, and hence twisting up the climate. Hence, understanding the interplay between the meteorological element and aerosols is the key to understanding some of the complex climate challenges and fostering sustainable future. Thank you. Thank you, Tamana. Building on that talk, which of the following is not considered an aerosol? Is it A, water vapor? B, wildfire smoke? C, sea salt? Or D, plant pollen? Alina. C. Oh. We switched. I got confused. A D, plant pollen. Plant pollen is incorrect. I think. I have a really good view from up here. Water vapor. Water vapor is correct. Our next speaker is Ganesh Tiwari from the NSLS2 Photon Science Division. Ganesh is a fan of the science fiction works of Douglas Adams, particularly The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, as evidenced by his talk title. Ganesh believes in the sentiment expressed by the main character, in that the chances of finding out what's really going on in the universe are so remote, the only thing to do is hang the sense of it and keep yourself occupied. Today, Ganesh has produced The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Next Light Source. Please welcome Dr. Tawari. Thank you, Sarah. Hello, everyone. In the, in the science fiction novel series, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the supercomputer casually replies, 42 when the protagonist asks the question of ultimate, the ultimate question of life, universe, and everything. In real world, we use x-rays to probe matter as one of the ways to understand life. Let's trace back how far we have come in doing so. X-rays were discovered by physicist Strongton almost 100 years ago. In 1952, Gosling took an x-ray image of human DNA in Franklin's lab. This beautiful image helped confirm the double wiggly shape of the DNA and basically revolutionized our basic understanding of life. In today's dedicated light source, we generate X-rays by sending electron beams moving at the speed of light in periodic magnets. Like Daniel said, we can find these electron beams in a circle by using series of bending magnets and we can use the light from each of these magnets to probe various samples. Today, US Department of Energy has four dedicated light source as user facilities, one of them being the National Synchrotron Light Source 2 at Brookhaven National Lab. These facilities help shed light on how materials and biolife 
are formed, interact, and evolve under various conditions, whether it is mechanism of ion channels in cell membranes or mapping ribosomes at the atomic level. So how can we do this better? Of course, we can improve accuracy by increasing X-ray signal counts and minimize sample damage by reducing exposure time of the sample, exposure time of the sample. Uh, this calls for an intense, stable, and pure light source we call the X-ray laser. So since we already know how to generate X-rays, we merely need mirrors and lenses to guide the X-ray back so that we can amplify it further and further. The last 20 years of progress in X-ray optics and today's manufacturing capabilities can provide us with highly efficient crystal-based X-ray meters and compound lenses. So thus putting together the X-ray optics and the light source work, I, along with my colleagues at Argonne and Brookhaven, have studied various combination of the light source and X-ray optics with the theoretical models we have developed and the selective optics I have identified to mask the feasibility criteria. We found in principle they work as we expected. However, reality comes with misalignments or misperfections. So I simulated these devices under various vibrations or misalignments. As long as we keep the errors within the tolerance level of the anticipated machine operation that we aim to build, we find that the power drop in the X-ray laser is limited to within 42%. And the X-ray laser is still outperforms existing light sources by orders of magnitude. In other words, yes, X-ray laser is possible. It may not be the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. However, it is the next step to advancing our science and society. Thank you. Thank you, Ganesh. Through management efforts, BNL maintains an estimated deer population of 100 to 150, 250 to 300, 400 to 450, three. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's A. A. A, 100 to 150? That is incorrect. C, 400. 400 to 450? Also incorrect. <laughs> yeah. I, thought, I think that gentleman right there. <laughs> B. B, 250 to 300 is correct. I think we've all seen reasonably more than 3D around here. Our next speaker is Tiffany Victor Lovelace from the NSLS2 Biological, Environmental, and Planetary Science Division. Tiffany loves to organize, including her files, pantry, and closet, because she finds it relaxing. She also enjoys recreating recipes at home from restaurant favorites. Today, Tiffany describes engineering stress-tolerant microbes for the future. Please welcome Dr. Victor Lovelace. When you think of a superhero, who do you think of? For some of you, maybe it's the Hulk, or for others, maybe it's Spider-Man because of his web action. Well, in my research, the superheroes are fungi that help rescue the plants from metal stress. 
Now these aren't just any types of fungi. These are special classes of fungi that protect their plants, and in return, the host plants provide the fungi with food that they produce in the form of carbohydrates. Okay, maybe you're thinking that the hulk still sounds cooler, but hold on. It turns out that these fungi are able to grow in soils with very toxic concentrations of different metals. In my case, I'm interested in looking at zinc. Yes, it's an essential nutrient, but it's also toxic to plants in very high concentrations. Example, near mines or industrial zones. Um, near mines or industrial zones. I know I'm blanking out. Near mines or industrial zones. <laughs> Yeah, mine's in the show. All right, so if we could understand how these fungi are able to grow in this nutrient stress, we could take that superpower that it has and transfer it to other fungi so that they could protect their host plants. Yes, each plant has a unique set of super hero fungi that it uses to protect itself. Now, why is that important? If we could get these plants or trees to grow on these unusable lands, then they could be used to capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it below ground in other forms of carbon. Now, this is really important because it can reduce global warming. Ah, but the question that I'm really interested in is how exactly those fungi are able to do that. Well, for this goal, I use a very bright X-ray microscope or the National Synchrotron Light Source 2 to look at the fungi when it grows with plants and without plants and at different zinc concentrations. By doing that, we're able to see how exactly the fungi are able to deal with the zinc stress that it's experiencing. What's really unique about doing this with the synchrotron is that it allows us to really zoom in to see this seemingly invisible fungi and then zoom out, see how it weaves around plant cells and zoom out some more so that we could see what's going on on an ecosystem level but understanding it at different length scales. So far, our results have shown that these fungi are able to trap the positive zinc ions on its body using negative molecules or even trapping it inside its body in tiny organs called organelles. Next, we're hoping that we could identify the genes that are used in these mechanisms and then transferring those genes into other fungi so that they could get that superpower to protect their host plants. In conclusion, this approach allows us to grow trees on unusable metal stress soils so that they could be used for carbon capture and even bioenergy production. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. The first chemical synthesis of a human protein was done at Brookhaven National Laboratory. This protein was A, rubisco, B, collagen, C, filgrastin, or D, insulin. Ooh. Oh, a hand over here. Is it insulin? Insulin is correct. <laughs> Our final speaker is David Yang from the Condensed Matter Physics and Materials Science Department. David competed against Joey Chestnut in the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest and was also a torchbearer for the 2015 Pan American Games. He is sharing his research today about magic crystals. Please welcome Dr. Yang. When I was in Manhattan last weekend, I noticed a store selling healing crystals. I stood outside of the shop, thinking about how on earth can these chunks of quartz and emesis possess seemingly magical properties like enhanced prosperity 
or energize the soul of whoever's holding them. Upon thinking about it more, I realize that I'm actually studying what some might call magic crystals. I'm looking at a crystalline material called strontium titanate, which is right, made right here at Brookhaven National Laboratory. This material is used extensively in electronic devices, like your cell phones, but notably, it's a material that's used to make superconductors. Superconductors are fascinating because they can carry electricity, like electrical wires, but with zero energy loss. The caveat is that this only occurs below minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. If we can make a superconductor that can operate at around room temperature, it will have the potential to drastically decrease the energy demands of society. Arguably, the most promising application is that it can help make nuclear fusion reactors become a viable, clean energy source. It would be like taking the sun and putting it inside of a bottle and using that energy for our daily needs. However, achieving something like this requires many small steps. We first need to understand the physics behind every aspect of these superconductors from bottom up. Strontium titanate is actually a material that some of these superconductors are grown on. The magical thing that occurs to strontium titanate below minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit is that it undergoes a phase transition, like when water freezes into ice. This phase transition can affect the properties of the superconductor that's grown on strontium titanate. But to understand how, we first need to understand this phase transition more carefully. To do this, I'm using an X-ray imaging method called BRAC coherent diffraction imaging, which is relatively new. In fact, NSLS2, a cutting edge X-ray research facility here at Brookhaven National Laboratory, has started building a dedicated instrument for this method, and there are strong reasons why. This technique allows us to accurately visualize the 3D crystal shape, shown behind me as colored cubes in the top row, which match very well with the black and white microscope images of the crystal in the background. But what's more promising is that this technique allows us to see the distortion inside of the crystal, which is shown behind me in the images on the bottom row. As you can see from my slide, I recently observed how the distortion inside this crystal changes as it's being cooled down to the temperatures at which these superconductors operate. This allows my colleagues and I to better understand the phase transition in order to better predict how strontium titanate behaves in different applications. My results can possibly enable a viable, clean energy solution to meet the world's growing energy demands by showing why it is physics and not magic that's responsible for the crystal's properties. Thank you. Thank you, David. Everybody ready? Last trivia question. In a typical year, B&L sees how many participants through OEP programming? Is it A, 1,200, B, 3,500, C, 10,000, or D, greater than 20,000? Is it C? C-10,000 is incorrect. D, greater than 20,000? D, greater than 20,000 is correct. <laughs> see, we see a lot of people. We do a lot of programs. So this concludes our competition. Let's have a round of applause for all of our contestants one more time. <laughs> Voting for the People's Choice winner is now open. Please scan the QR code on the screen or on the agenda that you received to make your selection. You may only vote once. Voting will close at 2.50 p.m. today. We invite you now to a reception in the lobby while the judges deliberate, and please join us back here in the auditorium at 3 p.m. for the award ceremony. Thank you. All right, welcome back. At this time, we will announce the winners of our SLAM competition, starting with the People's Choice winner. So again, this is the audience selected winner. And our winner, for the people's choice is Daniel Marks.
That's yours. You can take that with you. Just bring that to any bank. You're good. Our third place winner, Tiffany Victor Lovelace. Our second place winner, Zhang Jing Jiang. And our first place winner, and the individual who will also be going to the National Lab Research Slam competition, Daniel Marks. To be clear, this was a very difficult decision for the judges, hence the reason we took the entire 40 minutes to make that decision. Congratulations again to all of our participants. You did an absolutely wonderful job. I hope you had as much fun as I did. I would like to invite the winners back on stage so you can take pictures with the judges as well. Thank you for coming.